Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this rainy Wednesday afternoon. This is our final uh, presentation of the research exchange for this semester, so we're delighted to have you here with us. My name is Camille Crittenden. I direct the Data and Democracy Initiative here at Citrus, and we're delighted to have Professor Dan Kamen uh, here to talk with us this afternoon. I also want to welcome our web uh, visitors. The presentation is being live cast also on the other Citrus campuses, those being Merced, Davis, and Santa Cruz, so we're delighted to have them with us as well. A couple of reminders of upcoming events. Later on this afternoon is the Citrus Holiday Gala starting at 3.30, so if you aren't studying for finals or have other obligations, please come back and enjoy some refreshments and uh, socializing with other Citrus faculty and students and, and administrative staff. On Friday afternoon at 1 o'clock, uh, I4 Energy will have a talk on infrastructure-mediated sensing. And from my own program, Data and Democracy, I wanted to invite you to an event that we're hosting on Monday afternoon. Monday, December 10th, is Human Rights Day. And we are holding this event, I put a couple flyers in the back if you saw it, um, called We Witness, a panel on digital video, social media, and political protest. That's at 4.30, so it should be really interesting, and we would love to have you here for that. So to introduce our uh, esteemed speaker, Dan Kamen is professor in the Energy and Resources Group, professor of public policy in the Goldman School of Public Policy, and professor of nuclear engineering here at UC Berkeley. He is also the director of the Renewable and Appropriate Energy Laboratory, which you'll probably hear more about this afternoon. Kamen advises the United States and Swedish Agencies for International Development, the World Bank, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the African Academy of Sciences, and the President's Committee on Science and Technology. He's also a member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Please join me in welcoming Professor Dan Kamen. Thanks so much. Well, thank you all for being here today, uh, especially with, uh, with the local weather that caused a massive traffic back up at my daughter's uh, school and drop off. So I don't think I'm going to get through all the things that I had planned to cover, which probably is a good sign, because um, it means there's a lot to talk about. But I'm going to try to do two things um, today. One is to talk through what has been changing internationally. So I'll start off with a lot of the back and forth on the policy side of energy access for all, which is sort of appropriate given that the climate negotiations are going on right now in the Middle East. Many of the groups I'll be talking about today were ardent or lukewarm supporters of the process and are, have in many ways soured to the process. Many people who had soured to the process have suddenly got uh, at least a brief burst of religion because of Superstorm Sandy. And so trying to figure out where to position research and deployment projects in the area of energy access is something that a lot of the students and some of the faculty here are directly involved in. And so I'm actually um, going to try to do a couple things. One is just to highlight where I think the status of what's a very basic problem, energy access for everybody, is. Um, and that yet another, yet, there's yet another new uh, hat or chapeau for the discussions around international energy. And Maybe there's actually some substantial change in this area, largely pushed by um, the, 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 the confluence of the head of the UN and the head of the World Bank in this area. Um, and I'll, I'll take a look about that. I will only briefly highlight lots of the interesting technologies. I'll look at some of the off-grid lighting items in particular, but not on, not, not, we're not going to do a deep dive here. I'm going to sort of highlight them as, as examples of things that are in process. Um, I try never to give a talk anymore without highlighting somewhere up front that we need people like almost everyone at Berkeley who thinks about the whole systems, um, aspects of the story. And um, we had the, the rail laboratory, which is based here in, um, on the fourth floor, highlighted. Um, but there's a, a reconstituted group, the Berkeley Rural Energy Group. And uh, I think Dimitri, I saw somewhere is here, um, who is uh, one of the the chairs of that group right now, and so I'm going to kind of highlight uh, what Bregg is doing and his plans to do as, as part of the end part of the process. Um, to give a place for 
a number of efforts that are already ongoing um, to sort of connect. And so um, we'll come back, and I think during the q and I may ask Dimitri to talk a little bit about some of the student groups that are, that, that are active in, in BREG right now. Um, and I'm going to jump to my conclusion right off, just for those people who have to go, or mainly because really the whole point is there's a website, and so um, since the students, at least in my classes, can never seem to resist uh, looking things up, I'm going to jump right to it. And that is, there's a process that started off quite humbly, um, and it was a NGO-sponsored effort to get individual stories of climate change research up on a single site where they're searchable on a large number of dimensions. And so the idea of the climatehotmap.org uh, website was that as much as we talk about the global climate change story, in many ways it comes down to not just the local science of how much we're seeing climate change in a given location and to what R squared or other um, correlation can you tie what's going on locally to the global story, but as, these, uh, as the different interests the wax and wane, whether it's around carbon or only energy, or not only, or energy access, as those stories come back and forth, it really helps to have versions of the climate change dynamics available to not only look at what the science is. And so each of these pins on the map is designed to be a case where a research group or an NGO group or some consortium is committed to continuing to update what is the status of their climate science investigation, but most critically, what on the good and the bad side is going on in terms of Debates around this, is the science changing? Are the responses to the science, are there climate deniers that are you know, sending them lots of, information, uh, lots of information or misinformation, however you want to put it? And they're, they're committed individually to tracking how that climate change story keeps playing out. And so it's a great website because you can search it on a whole bunch of different areas, obviously geographically, but you can select the issues around coral reef bleaching and around change of species range and a whole variety of features. Um, intense storms, et cetera, et cetera. And essentially what I'm, I'm going to come back to in the end, because one of the challenges of Berkeley um, that Berkeley faculty say to each other all the time is that, gee, I meet you, professor or researcher in a certain area, more frequently in Moscow airport or in Beijing airport than I do on campus. Um, and there are some tight-knit groups that, that don't have that problem, but many, many groups have that. Um, and so finding a way for a lot of the stories on the solution side of this equation to start finding ways to map and to organize their work together. Essentially, the whole pitch today is going to be, I would like to see us develop a more integrated and an easier funnel for a not a climate change map, but the climate solutions map. Um, where these stories get tied together, and I'll illustrate a couple that our lab will be contributing in a, in a little bit. And there's a program, and I didn't, um, is, Diego, uh, is, is Diego here? Okay, so we have another effort um, where a student in the Energy Resources Group, uh, Diego Ponce de Leon, is the, is the main coordinator, that's tying together 20 um, academic scholars, mid-career, uh, generally as associate or assistant professor, from all over the Americas in a very new Fulbright program called Fulbright Nexus. And it's the program's only in its second year, so there's lots of flexibility, but the idea of the Fulbright Nexus program is these are scholars involved in energy and climate issues that have at least a component of their interest on the applied side, or at least following the political story kind of similar to this map here, and that group of 20 uh, scholars, five from the US, 15 from Latin America and the Caribbean, just committed that while they undergo their own individual Fulbright type of projects this year, they're also going to organize into teams and begin to populate a map like this, where there are stories of solutions. And this is solutions written very generally. So I'm not biasing towards mitigation versus adaptation. It's really a broad mix. 
And our goal for this coming 12-month uh, uh, cycle is to build such a map. And so one thing I'm hoping comes out of this conversation with not only those of you in the room, but people who are involved in the Citrus conversation at other campuses, if there's a case that you would like to get involved in here, we're going to try to make this as pain-free as possible. So we'll have a programmer involved in compiling information. Um, so we won't say, you know, those of you who raised your hand to volunteer yourselves then get stuck with lots of painful effort. But we're going to try to build a version of this story. Um, and this began really as a very humble effort at a couple foundations. And it ended up being on a number of, of high-level efforts, both within the IPCC and in the US um, House and Senate, a really key go-to place. In particular, because when given, um, uh, given uh, uh, senators or others weren't, you know, were sort of not believing in the story, having pins in their particular states or where their com companies are based ended up being a pretty big deal in the conversation. So I'll come back to, to, to that in a bit. Um, and, and that's really where I want to end up the conversation. Now, I almost always begin these talks as well by trying to highlight that the dialogue around climate change, and I'll get to the climate solutions just after one slide, is equally a story about the science as it is about the language and the process. And so where I tend to like to illustrate this is with the generic um, climate change um, indicators graphs in terms of what we have for a number of, of, of the key indicators. But what the IPCC, with, that many of you are involved in, has gotten to in terms of its conclusion at each of the stages of the assessment reports, from the first assessment report in 1990 to the fifth assessment report that's going on right now, um, was as follows. The dialogue over where we were really started with the first assessment report done in 1990, and its strongest conclusion, or the press release worthy conclusion, if you will, from that whole effort was that it will take an additional decade to get unequivocal detection of climate change. Um, and each word in here was battled over and negotiated at some excruciating length. There's one word coming up on the next, um, on the next report that literally took nine hours. And I, some of you are nodding. You might have been in the room when this one word took nine hours. But if the first report says, give us work for the coming decade, because we're not sure yet, um, the second assessment report in 95 said the balance of evidence suggests discernible. Discernible is the nine hour word. Um, discernible human influence, and literally, um, I was not in the negotiation room. I had gone home much earlier that night. Um, but if any of you were here and want to correct me, that's, that, that I, I would appreciate it. But my take on it the next morning, being at the meeting, was that discernible was largely settled on, not because it was like the perfect word and it encapsulated where the, where the story was. It was that it was 4.50 AM. And everyone was so tired that discernible sounded good enough at the moment. Many people said they would come back and contest it later on. It actually made it through um, the discussions afterwards. So discernible at the second report in 95 was here. The third assessment report in 2001, you see we're already starting to get slippage in terms of the year of publication, said most of the warming is likely with a 66% confi confidence interval due to human activities. That was a significant step forward. And then the fourth assessment report that really was a painful but interesting process. And how many people were directly involved, either as contributing authors or reviewers, for the fourth assessment? Wow. OK, I'm actually surprised. So OK. Um, so the fourth assessment did this really interesting thing. And it came up with not only a, if you will, improved um, confidence um, number on the first, that most of the warming will likely, with a much higher uh, confidence, um, uh, due to human activity. But then the first of the statements, and the hope is that the fifth assessment report we're being worked on now will have some even more extensive versions that said warming will most strongly and quickly impact the global poor. And that was very carefully chosen not to be only in developing countries. This is the poor on a global basis, um, something that many groups here um, at the Blum Center, some of the teams uh, working between economics and engineering um, are, are exploring in some direct ways. And that's a pretty key normative part of the story. It was very controversial. There's lots of sort of infighting for whether the IPC should have made statements like this. I think it's proven to be incredibly important and valuable that it was, that it was made. 
The most recent IPCC round that I was involved with was the special report on renewable energy published last year that came up with a statement that 80% clean energy future is possible if, and the if is like some horrible COBOL if-then statement that goes on for pages and pages, um, but it was if the following long list of conditions were met that the decarbonization consistent with what the IPC science says is needed is possible statement. My hope is that in the same way that from the second to the third, that higher probability and more confidence can come in that this list of ifs, um, ifs and thens can get reduced dramatically in, in, the, in the coming version of the story. Up until Hurricane Sandy, the international business community engagement in the climate process had been uh, had been essentially waning and waning and waning more and more. It is possible, although there's reason to be skeptical, that recent superstorm interest is going to put things back on the agenda. The day after the election, uh, uh, President B Obama said, I'm going to uh, focus on climate change action. Um, Harry Reid in the Senate uh, reaffirmed it the next day. So there's suddenly kind of a new interesting window of identifying how we can uh, both address storms and perhaps take advantage of the, of the, of the crises in the Rahm Emanuel wording to, to use the storms to get climate change language back on the table. There's also lots of reason to be skeptical um, that th this will be sustained. Um, so until we see how the new interest in storms and climate plays out, whoops, I shouldn't do that, um, the overall position of many of the industry groups, including things like uh, US, uh, the, the US um, climate uh, group where many big companies were involved was fading further and further away from tying clean energy projects to carbon and, 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 and greenhouse gas issues. One of the aspects of that was that in, uh, in 2011, after sort of a year-long effort, um, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon announced that 2012 was going to be the year of sustainable energy. And one of the aspects of that story was the assessments by the International Energy Agency and others that the pace that we were on to bring energy services to the 1.4, or 5, you see between 1.4 to 1.6 billion people who don't have access by 2030 was essentially on a path for full failure in the sense that the forecasts were that there was basically going to be the same number of people who didn't have access in 2030 as today. So that's a terrible equation. And when one looks at these charts, which I can barely read because the bright lights, but maybe uh, you guys can. This gives a pie chart of people in rural areas, in the, in the maroon, and then in urban areas. Um, I can't even tell the color from here, apologies. Um, but the circle on the left is today, and the circle on the right is the estimate for 2030. And you can see that while Latin America expects to see a decrease in those without access, um, Sub-Saharan Africa um, expects to see an increase, and um, South, South Asia expects to see more or less uh, no change and a little decrease in Southeast Asia. So that's a recipe saying that for all of the activities and interest going on, largely through official um, aid and development channels that were not on a path to improve things particularly at all. And in fact, if we start to look at the issues of energy poverty, there's a very strong correlation of the areas without access to those places that are using solid fuels, which should be no surprise because that's the, that's the fallback option. And so this, this recipe is one that's terrible on a variety of fronts. And there's been more and more useful analysis of correlations, not necessarily causations, of which I find one of the most compelling pictures. And I hope people can, can read these. Well, I think I put up the, yeah, I put up the names inside for those, for those with eyes like mine that can't read the details. But each of these knee curves show as a function of, of, of uh, these are electricity consumed from very small amounts per capita per year to kind of high in industrial amounts, that literacy, education, child mortality, um, uh, poverty, and sanitation all show this kind of characteristic curve where at the very low end of consumption, you get a significant improvements as you ramp up. So there's a huge benefit of providing those initial kilowatt hours or access to to efficient forms of, of non-electricity energy. And then there's kind of a long 
if you will, policy or infrastructure dominated aspect where many different types of strategies get roughly the same outcomes. Um, you know, people often cite US and Japan with dramatically different energy uh, consumption per capita, but quite, um, uh, but quite similar outcomes overall. But these curves that have been explored in a lot of detail um, really show a very strong, uh, at least correlation, and people are trying to push further on to kind of look more root causes, but highlighting that there's just massive benefits at the low end of, of, of this curve. Part of, the, uh, part of the story of making this, this clearer is to really highlight exactly what are those other benefits to society in terms of reduced health costs, better productivity of workers, better resilience of communities as one ramps up the amount of, of energy use in, in the process. So, a number of efforts to quantify these relationships, to explore things like why are there groups of countries that seem to perform much better, even at very low amounts of energy, the kind of the upper left corner of the curve is an area where there's a lot of work needed and a lot of opportunities to fill in those solution charts in a, in a variety of ways to highlight what's, what's, what's going on in the process. Largely in response to this conversation, I went in 2010 to the World Bank, um, where I both wanted to see how the process worked and wanted to engage in the World Bank's own efforts to develop a new energy strategy for the coming decade. And so I spent a year at the bank. Um, I've been back now for just about a year. And there's been an interesting cycle around this analysis. The reason why um, the bank is, 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 a, is an interesting place to do this is that they are the single largest multinational lender for energy development projects. They have an annual energy uh, budget of about $8 billion of their own dollars. And depending what the multiplier is, meaning the amount that comes in from co-finance sources, central banks of the countries where they're working, um, other investors, the multiplier is between about 3.5 and 4.2, depending how you do the math. So it's a significant amount of money um, that they lend. And because it is managed in a way with a board of directors, they're called, um, uh, the board of directors are basically the seats on the bank. Um, and all of the major countries have a seat. And then there's all kinds of interesting um, grouping. So Ireland and the Caribbean share one of these seats. And how that came about is a long story. But, but there's 30-some-odd um, there's of these seats. So I went to the bank to work on their strategy for how to green their portfolio and how to bring better practices in terms of assessing the, the impacts and benefits of, of, of energy access and of clean energy projects and how to transform their portfolio. When I arrived, the bank was about 40 to 45 percent clean i.e. non-fossil, and how you define it is, uh, is questionable. And now it's a little bit over 50%. Um, percent. And there are calls, of course, for everything that the bank should lend largely to the least cost projects in current definition. So a lot of the fossil projects to calls that the bank should be a leader and should divest entirely from fossil fuels. So we worked on the strategy very intensely during my year. I actually waited so that the bank had concluded it's 65 regional consultations, which, no surprise, came up with everything from the bank should do what I just said, invest only in current projects, to the bank should only invest in nuclear when they talked, for example, to, uh, to advocates in France, to they should only invest in off-grid solar when, when, when they went and talked to kind of the solar community. So these 65 consultations, I think, just populated the space. They didn't really boil it down. Um, so we worked on the strategy, and it was submitted to the World Bank's um, board in April 2011, and this is the Committee on Development Effectiveness that evaluates how the project should work. Um, the, the, uh, the document went in um, as, a, as a joint strategy of all aspects of the World Bank. And so the World Bank itself, um, the International Finance Corporation, um, and then the, the other key components. This is all a secret document only for um, members of the bank's internal, um, basically the executive officers to review. And two days after it went to this secret internal committee, it appeared um, online on the e and &E website. Um, and so it was up for discussion very early on in the process. 
It was 100 pages long. It had lots of interesting things about we need to invest more in household energy. We need to find ways to, to support subnational and regional efforts. A lot of things I think were very useful. But ultimately, it boils down, in my opinion, to two critical paragraphs and really two critical sentences that were the, were the center of debate and ultimately why the strategy was neither rejected nor adopted. Um, and they came up with the follow, and there was the following key aspects. So in terms of coal, what, what we said is that the World Bank will restrict its financing to power, gener um, to power generation in countries for the purpose of increasing access. Um, and new coal projects will only be financed in the poorest countries, not middle-income countries, subject to a whole variety of, um, of, 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 of restrictions in terms of not making environmental issues worse, a variety of features. Um, both the US and the World Bank and the European Union have investment criteria when you should do coal and when you shouldn't. Um, and this restriction did not um, address the poorest countries. It only, um, it only addressed middle-income countries with the argument made that coal is quite a mature technology. And while the poorest countries may, and people have argued strongly whether you should or shouldn't, um, should build coal plants at all, middle-income countries did not need the World Bank's financing to build their coal projects. If you're going to do it, your own story. This generated a massive firestorm. Um, huge argument about, uh, about this process. Um, a number of major developing countries, all in middle or higher income, led a, effectively a revolt against doing this because it restricted mon monies that were available. Um, this is, again, just the, the overall front page of the report. Um, and the version that appeared online on the website, you can see it as E&E &E Publishing right here, even though it says below. This is a secret internal document. Um, but yeah, these things happen. And there's the website for this super secret uh, document for anyone who wants to unload it, uh, download it. If you just do a Google search for World Bank Energy Strategy, you can, you can download your version to examine. The argument around coal, um, again, largely uh, there was an opposition movement led by uh, developing countries that said, do not restrict lending in this area. Um, battles went back and forth. And I had personally expected that that battle would largely um, result in the World Bank pulling back on that or finding some, some exceptions for projects that were in the pipeline or some such feature. Um, the process never got there, largely because as the debate was going on, the president of the bank announced he was stepping down. So the conversation was not concluded. Um, bank protocol is that you really don't pass major new uh, policy reforms in the lame duck period at the end of a term. Um, but this statement around coal, I had thought would have been negotiated around. Um, and that the key statement that I was expecting an even bigger battle on um, was never debated widely because of the firestorm around the first one. And it was that the World Bank will undertake greenhouse gas emissions analysis, not necessarily signing a price, but will do the math um, as a business requirement to help countries identify options and look at costs and benefits. And that this is the place where I had sort of prepared lots of material and had a lot of countries that were, um, that were going to support an effort around this effort. Um, with the argument that the bank may or may not build any more coal projects, but getting analysis on the table. And there's already very good methodologies to do the assessment. The International Finance Corporation in particular has a very, uh, very clear and good methodology that it uses. It's actually kind of ironic because they're the largest funders of coal projects in the bank. Um, and they're the most profitable part of the bank. So there's a, uh, a, a bit of a bizarre piece in the story. But it's actually around this issue that I really thought that the, the efforts and the battle should be waged. And just for completeness, I put in the talk more of the details, but we're not going to go through those here. Um, starting the greenhouse gas analyses right away. Um, again, not assigning a price, but obviously the implication was that once you do the math, one should get to thinking about a price. And this is the process that... Uh, the new president, um, President Kim of the World Bank, a former, um, former president of, of Dartmouth College and a public health um, researcher and campaigner, has just announced to sort of back on the table. And this is where I'll focus some of the comments. But I do want to highlight the story in terms of thinking about 
what are some of the cost estimates out there to address various aspects of the story, because they're a useful starting ground in the conversation. So again, I apologize. I can barely read these myself. So uh, if I can't, um, maybe you guys can't as well. But in, in, in hundreds of billions of dollars, this highlights a number of forecasts for how much different groups like Bloomberg New Energy, um, the International Energy Agency and others, going from about 100 to about 300 billion a year, are the estimated costs to address and to invest significantly to meet the climate target. So this is really based around um, getting to a two, uh, uh, keeping us under a two degree C overall, um, overall target. And so kind of setting a range of different estimates, but, but it kind of in, the, in the hundreds of billion category. And highlighting against that is the 30 to about 60 billion a year that it's estimated is needed to change that, um, that energy access story, to by 2030 to have provided energy access to all. And there's a number of assessments that were done, um, one by YASA, another one uh, uh, by one of my collaborators, Morgan Bazillion, and we've summarized those in kind of a recent paper on the story. So kind of setting a, um, a significant but presumably not insurmountable target given that the commitment not, uh, not fulfilled yet is that by 2020, the international negotiations are supposed to result in a global green fund where there's $100 billion a year to spend. So well within the target of, of, of achieving access. So this was the, the, the basis for this significant push by Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the UN, to push forward on the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. So the website is here, and I would urge people to go take a look at it. Um, this was a effort around universal access to energy as the first part of the story, doubling the rate of improvement or the deployment rate of energy efficiency, and doubling the global share of renewable energy both by 2030. So be, be consistent with that, um, with sort of undoing that, that no change in energy access by 2030 story that I highlighted in the very beginning, that initial energy, um, um, International Energy Agency assessment. This effort, um, I think, could be seen in the light of, well, the UN makes these kinds of initiatives all the time, and what do they lead to? I'm actually gonna, gonna remain in the optimistic category, certainly for now, and I hope for a while longer, because right now, almost all of the major industrial groups that more or less backed off um, significant support for the climate negotiation round have signed on to versions of this. And so I don't expect you to read this, but there's two groups, just sort of a, a list of the, industry, of the industry principles that goes down way off the page. But many, many of the large Fortune 500 companies are involved. There is a higher proportion of European companies than US companies, is no surprise. But a pretty interesting um, list of companies that have been investing pretty significantly in this effort. I'm on the technical group that, that, that developed a couple um, framing reports, also can be downloaded. And we divided ourselves into eff efforts around uh, task force one that was focused on the access question and, ta and, and, and report two that was focused around renewable energy and energy efficiency as efforts to bring together a lot of the different opportunities, really this, um, the opportunities to then put those solution pins on a map at the opening of the UN Secretary, uh, sorry, of the General Assembly of the, of the UN in September, um, there was a very interesting event. Um, I, don't want to I don't want to ascribe it all to the South Korean, South Korean collaboration, but I think it had a lot to do with it. But this is the first major initiative in this area where the UN and the World Bank, both of whose principals are now South Koreans, um, teamed up to not only launch the Sustainable Energy for All effort, and the gentleman right on, the, uh, on your right here, Kandi Yumkela from West Africa, uh, former head of UNIDO, is now head of that Sustainable Energy for All effort. Um, but this was the launch of something where, again, many of you who are working on sustainable energy efforts at large scale or small scale, I would be very interested to your reactions to both what are in these framing documents as well as, more importantly, when you go to the website, um, 
the commitments that have already been made by some of the major industrial companies have really gotten pretty substantial in a number of areas. Uh, and some of them have funded projects that are going on at Berkeley, at LBL, at Stanford, at some of the, the major local players. So there is a real push to get funding, um, funding and projects out the door right now. And it's led to a number of very interesting conversations. And I'll skip to some of the background in terms of um, uh, so some of the, uh, the language and the details, none of which will surprise people here. The commitments that measure up and, and, get, and get highlighted by this effort um, are those that clearly indicate a departure from business as usual, so not just repurposing funds that have been pledged 10 times over to the UN, which seems to be a part of the process. Um, efforts that that are very clear in how they tie together efficiency and renewables, a part of the story that's, again, kind of second nature in the Bay Area, um, but often gets lost in the translation outside, and that the champions of the process, in particular on the industry side, have been establishing either within their firms or in partnerships with governments a series of initiatives that are designed to make significant resources available in this area. Um, one of them that gets a lot of attention is the Norwegian government um, announced a effort called Energy Plus that was designed uh, um, to put several hundred million dollars immediately available to large-scale projects. There's a number of efforts, in particular in East and Southern Africa, to work on deployment of a variety of, a variety of technologies. And again, I put some background slides in as well um, around these goals. And there's nothing surprising um, in, in these features. One of the aspects of the story and one of the reasons why the interdisciplinary aspect is so critical here, easy to do in academic papers, but much harder to continue and sustain in practice, is something that we were working on back in, um, uh, uh, back in the mid-aughts, I guess that's what we call the, uh, the decade that's passed. And one of the features was as we looked, for example, at the transitions off of wood and off of charcoal as a large-scale fuel source uh, for Africa, and so we looked, for example, at the, frac uh, the, the amount of biofuels being used per capita across Africa, the darker the colors, the higher usage rates. When we started to look in detail at scenarios to slowly or more aggressively replace traditional biofuels with electricity, with, mo with more modern and clean biofuels subsidized or not by local governments or regional development banks, we came back again and again to a story that is now pretty clear, and that is the non-greenhouse gas benefits of most of those calculations really dominate. Um, in our analysis, the health benefits of transitioning off traditional fuels were dramatically larger um, on equivalent dollar bases to efforts to, to get what's the greenhouse gas benefit of, of dramatically beating down the amount of fossil fuels being used by that poorest billion people. There are some notable examples. Black carbon in South Asia may be one of the places where the, where the climate story um, gets fairly, fairly large. And, um, but in sub-Saharan Africa, you've got a much, much bigger signal in terms of agricultural benefits, um, in terms of health benefits, in terms of water benefits of making the transition. And so one aspect of this equation is that efforts in this area, I think, really need to, to look very carefully at are they really looking at the full range of benefits of projects? And that's, again, much easier said than done. Um, and we, you know, the, the paper has graph after graph looking at different transition scenarios, but that story emerges from a whole variety of, of pieces of that equation. Another aspect of the story where we were very concerned is that it turns out that the number of metrics that are available to think through those transitions, those graphs with the knee in them that I highlighted in the beginning, were really very few and required, in many cases, a lot of data to work on. So one area where, again, academic teams have proven really useful to efforts from uh, projects, Novozymes, for example, has a large-scale effort to replace traditional wood and charcoal use um, um, in all the major cities in, in Mozambique with more, uh, with, with more modern, cleaner fuels um, is one that they were critically in need of metrics to look at the process. And so one area where um, our lab has been partnering with others to look at this is to say, what is the analogy, for example, with the so-called Gini coefficient, where the, uh, the traditional Gini idea, um, the economic one, is that as you, as you go from the poorest individual um, to the richest, 
that if you had a line of per perfect equity, meaning as you ramped up the, uh, the income curve, um, that that share of income would be proportional. We don't see that, of course. We see the richer populations having a much higher share. So perfect equity would be the diagonal. Perfect inequity would be one individual with all the money. Um, the kind of the Mo Ibrahim in Sudan sort of story. Um, most countries exhibit curves uh, called Lorentz curves that have shapes like this. And so we looked at that not for income, but for energy. You get a very similar picture in terms of access to energy as you go up the, uh, the, um, the, the cumulative population curve. And so probably no surprise, the most energy equitable uh, one of the countries that we surveyed initially was Norway. There's the curve for the United States. Um, El Salvador and Thailand are here. And then a country with low electrification rates, um, a lot of, of, of solid fuel use. Kenya shows uh, with the curve in terms of electricity um, as really the richest few have the largest um, share of access. Metrics like this are in hugely short supply. And so in the projects that many of you are doing, finding aspects that, that tell the story of not only energy access, but of the value of those energy services is hugely valuable. There's a whole aspect of the sustainable energy for all effort devoted to identifying and finding places where these metrics can become part of the data collection that countries that sign on to the process are doing today. And so again, in one of the places where, whether it's a pin on the map in a given country or metrics that can be used more broadly are being sought by this UN team, by um, by the Sustainable Energy for All initiative are finding ways to map out parts of that story. When I showed the initial slide highlighting the degree to which climate change is expected to impact the world's poor in developed and developing countries more rapidly, one aspect of that is there's a whole variety of initiatives that are designed to provide better energy access in industrial countries that are in many ways ideal laboratories to lay the story out. And so one of the groups that we've been working closely with, the students uh, here on campus have been engaged in a number of trainings with them is a group based in Oakland, California called Grid Alternatives. Um, who has gone through a Grid Alternatives training and or deployment project? Two, okay, we need to up that number. But Grid Alternatives is a, is, is a group founded by two former uh, Silicon Valley uh, venture, uh, venture capitalists that decided to form a group instead that would, util that would utilize school leavers, um, often from inner city high schools, as well as people coming out of incarceration, train them to do installation of not only renewable energy, largely rooftop solar, but also energy efficiency. Grid Alternatives has won a number of awards. They've been expanding their sphere to work in more and more um, uh, communities uh, in the U.S. West. And again, it's a partner that um, has, has worked quite well with UC Berkeley, but it's an example of finding the opportunities to address energy access, stability of costs, a, a long-term uh, security of costs for low-income individuals. The typical grid alternatives project is a partnership with a low-income housing project, sometimes in a partnership with um, Habitat for Humanity or not, and working with those people who are gonna move into the units to install energy efficiency, to install solar, to bring down the cost. And they've done a very wide range of things. We generally think of things um, you know, on, the, on the energy efficient appliance side and on solar side, but they've been looking at things like taking design examples from, um, this is an Ottoman, um, an, an Ottoman building outside Istanbul where they're doing these, this, this, the so-called bucket lights where you uh, take a, a, a container full of bleach, for example, um, the design issues of how to put it in place, um, partnering with programs, this one's in the Philippines, and putting these in to bring natural lighting in in significant amounts. And so doing everything from some of the simplest technology designs to the more, uh, to the more sort of standard ones, again, of efficiency and renewables. The reason why these kinds of efforts have not only proven effective, but also proven opportunities for companies and governments that are not necessarily on board on the climate story yet is because you can get such more rapid deployment of many of these technologies. And one of my favorite versions of the story is one that admittedly pokes a bit of fun at, at myself as well because I was involved in an effort um, so supported by um, the European Commission for Renewables um, in, the, in the 90s. And so this is a graph showing 
the forecast growth in deployed solar in a variety of areas. Um, remote applications, on-grid, off-grid systems, big industrial facilities. And you can see that, I mean, we worked pretty hard. It was a team of over 200 researchers, all of whom were, were solar zealots, if you will. And you can already, you know, you can look back in this curve. This was the assessments for how much solar would be, would be deployed in the year 2000. We made these in the mid-90s. Um, and all of the individual types of solar deployment, you can see they more or less have the same growth model with the parameter up and down based on kind of the starting uh, the amount of wedges. And we largely based this around what appeared at the time to be the least cost solar, which was largely large solar installations. The route that initially Japan went in terms of subsidizing quite significantly uh, both solar research and then deployment in small systems. What Germany did, California, New Jersey, a number of others, made small systems much more the leading edge of deployment. It brought a lot more um, um, innovators, and we got much more rapid progress on the learning curves. And in fact, while this is what this group of, of, of far from unbiased observers thought was the, um, sort of the, 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 the likely growth curve, this is what happened. Um, and that process of getting the smaller not least cost per watt, but often smaller cost per overall, whether it's a roof system or a solar home system, um, really went off the charts um, relative to that type of, um, to, to, to the, to the um, based on, uh, in comparison to the, the, the forecast curves. So my last example will be one where I see several people in the room who are active in this area, and it also follows this path of learning by experience and feeding that back into both research on technologies, basic material science, and deployment efforts. And that is one in the area broadly used to be called Lighting Africa. The program has now expanded significantly. And the assessment and analysis process that went into Lighting Africa technologies is really illustrative of what is not working well in the larger international deployment process but has proven as aggressive and as exciting a ramp up as the curve I just showed you. So the idea was, let's develop very low cost solar lights powered, uh, powered by very small solar panels, low cost LED lights, small battery, to at least provide lighting. This is a glorified flashlight, but a, but a locally rechargeable one. And the first meetings on this process at many of the big development agencies where this is an awful idea. And the awful idea generally focused around, this is not full electrification. This is, a, this is an emission of failure in terms of meeting those energy access goals. This is not a process that will bring you to all of the energy services that we expect in a modern household. And all of that's certainly true. But the evolution of this process is really interesting. It started off with a kind of a few dissidents um, at the World Bank, at the International Finance Corporation, at the US Department of Energy, and some, and some academics saying, we think we can make this product available and inexpensive. This particular one sells for about 12 US dollars. Here's a little larger model that's got a couple different lighting settings. This one's about $22. Um, and getting the infrastructure to not only sell these in lots of countries, but to test and vet the new units that, that came online and were available ended up being really critical. So a number of research labs, both here at Berkeley, at LBL, Evan Mills at LBL, um, Arnie Jacobson at Humboldt State, a number of people have been involved in the process of being testing laboratories for these products. And what we've seen is that while this is a very humble start at electrification, it really opens up not only basic services, but it allows lots of teams to innovate and create all kinds of new technologies and products. One of which is illustrated right here. Um, in each of these pictures, there's a little bag of adapters so that you can not only run your electric light, but you can now also um, charge your cell phone, which in rural areas can have an effective cost of several dollars per kilowatt hour if you need to bring your cell phone to a larger charging station, for example, which goes on a number of places. This is also because it's low cost, rapid turnover in terms of new technologies, has opened the door for lots and lots of innovations. 
there are now student competitions, teams at Philips Lighting and elsewhere that are adding to these small printed circuit um, a, um, AM and FM radios. There was a recent meeting uh, uh, just a couple weeks ago in Dakar where a number of groups announced that they were making very low, um, uh, low power consuming TVs um, with seven, eight, nine watts as their peak draw that could be run off these things as well. And so you're getting all kinds of different products. It is certainly not full electrification, um, but it really has changed the equation in terms of the ability to innovate and get involved in the process. Um, the, well, that's kind of a darker picture than it shows here. But the number of different products that are now available is really kind of blossoming. And I'll skip, because we're at 1 o'clock, I'll, I'll skip through these. Um, it has led to a whole variety of efforts. One, innovation on the technology side, but the other efforts by groups to figure out what is the value of having these processes to really test out and do consumer reports, if you will, on these technologies. A number of studies have gone on that have looked at the market, the market spoiling effect of having a few bad products in the market. This is something that our lab did a decade and a half ago for larger solar systems, but we're now getting uh, teams that are determining that if you can prevent bad products from entering the markets early on, it really dramatically changes uh, people's perception of how good and reliable products are. And having testing facilities, both, both based at universities that test out very, uh, sort of, uh, very, pro very early prototype products, but also facilities in country where you can evaluate how these products are going, has dramatically changed the market. So this Lighting Africa effort, which has now again evolved into a global campaign, is active now in over 30 African countries. The sales rates of these technologies, the number of new companies innovating in the market has really taken off. And it's an example of an effort that just like um, some of those early solar, pro solar programs was seen as not likely to produce significant results. Well, it's now being highlighted as one of the big success stories, actually, at the meeting going on in Doha. Whether that means that our um, our, uh, our scale and definition of vision is coming down? I don't think so. It's that we're finding new ways to bring research and, and business communities more broadly into the process. I'm going to skip through. I, I had a bunch of more slides that highlighted that part of the story. And I'm going to end there with, again, the call to, to uh, I want to go back to my initial slide there, um, to think about the opportunity to build on, whoops, there we go, to, to Slowly, it's uh, recovering here, very slowly. Was that a sign that I should be uh, ending? Uh -huh. I don't know why it's a, uh, someone has turned me off uh, somewhere in the process. Um, is, is, is really to highlight that the value of, yeah, I'm, I'm clicking away and seeing a change here, but it's not critical because I was going back to a slide I've showed in the very beginning. Doesn't like me. Ah, okay. Um, all right. So I won't go back to the slide I showed in the beginning, but I will kind of make the the, the open offer. Um, maybe in the questions we'll get back to the Berkeley Rural Energy Group. But what I'm hoping is that a number of the efforts that you're pursuing, whether it's metrics, new technology, partnerships with groups that have not found a way in but are interested in this space that populating one of these go-to locations to understand how these solutions have evolved, like the Lighting Africa story, um, is a place where we could make a huge contribution because, again, I'm going to say the broader, the Berkeley, Stanford, LBL, Santa Clara communities are a place where there's a huge amount of things going on in this space. And so if I could do anything from today's talk, it's really to invite people at, at those groups, at the other Citrus partners um, who are online, to really contact us to find parts of their story they'd like to highlight. So I'm going to come back to Dimitri in a bit, but thank you. Um, we're at 1 o'clock, and we'll stop and do discussion and questions. So thanks so much. So do we have any, any questions from the audience? I'm going to see if I can get this back online while you're Yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, there we go. 
I was wondering uh, about, uh, in your contacts with the World Bank, if you came into touch with groups uh, continuing right here. Ah, okay, uh, you know, continuing with the, the uh, hydro paradigm of, of dams and all that kind of stuff. It's the, you know, the international rivers groups are yep. the ones that are constantly pointing at the World Bank as a chief financer of, of these dams. And, of course, you can d define them as renewable, but they destroy the ecosystem, which is an anti-green phenomenon. So what, yeah. were you able to interact with these people? Thank you. So this, this couldn't be a more perfect question. So I am going to use my slide, Dan Susan. Um, so the answer is yes. And in fact, the scale of investment in large hydro, in particular in Africa, that's emerging from some of the regional plans, the African plan, is, is, is mind-boggling. 40 gigawatts of new hydro for example, is in the World Bank's Africa strategy. It's largely around the damming, um, uh, the, the, uh, the base of uh, the, the, the Congo River, and building the so-called Grand Inga project, which has been talked about for decades. Massive dam um, on par with Three Gorges, and actually sending that power as far away as Europe. And so a version of that story is one of the places where we're active. So this is actually. Um, our, our, our greeting party when I landed with a world wildlife um, uh, individual in, um, in Nimele in South Sudan. And this is exactly the kind of story you're talking about. There's assessments of a variety of groups for what to do on this stretch of the White Nile. And it's a very unusual part of the river. I've actually never seen geologic structures like this before. If someone else has, I'd love to know where they are. But I think I have a better picture. Yeah, here's one. The, the Nile flows down, and there are these literally right angle turns in the river. Um, it's a very unusual structure, but it lends itself kind of naturally to putting either hydrokinetic or smaller dams on the side pieces. And then they rejoin the river in a whole variety of these, these structures that go on over about a 50 mile um, stretch of the river. Just to give you a feeling for what one of these side channels look like, let's see if my uh, system works. Maybe it's on this. Here we go. This one will work. Come on. Um, it didn't, uh, shouldn't have run. That's interesting. It's supposed to have run. No. Huh. Um, well, anyway, this is a, I'm not going to try to find it because it's run over over time. But this is a channel. It's, it's no more than around 10 meters wide. And it's just an incredible rush of water. And so South Sudan is facing an interesting situation, exactly as you described. The Norwegians have offered them $100 million as a gift to put 60 megawatts of microhydro on these side channels. And part of that 100 million will go to electrifying in a, in, a, in a regional grid the communities around this part of the river. This is actually a very critical place. This is exactly where the road from Kampala, Uganda, up to the capital, Juba, goes through. So it's on a key commerce area. This town is likely to grow. 60 megawatts is the offer with, with regional electrification. The World Bank was asked to look at and thankfully declined a program to dam this entire section and to put a gigawatt scale dam in here and to, and to flood this entire area. The bank declined this project. A, another country has offered the financing to build the dam. I, did, I didn't hear you. <laughs> They're static. Right. Um, and no financing has been made available to connect this gigawatt dam to the nearest large uh, powers, uh, the po demand for power would be Kampala um, in Uganda. So right now, the, the South Sudanese government is, de is debating. And remember, the South, Sudanese, the South Sudan, while very poor individually, is very rich with oil and gas. So they don't need new revenue right now. Um, most of the bets right now are that they will select the large dam, even though there's no financing as of yet for the transmission as opposed to doing the small-scale hydro program, which, of course, doesn't, doesn't preclude doing the dam later. And 
part of the challenge and one of the areas where I actually feel a lot of sympathy for the multinational organizations, whether they have good or bad funding track records, is they feel a real strong pressure when projects like that come up. If they don't do them, there are now alternate funders that are quite willing to step in. And so while I think that you know, the, the core of the question is, how do you consider large-scale hydro in the process with, with, with significant environmental impacts? Um, right now, there's a real appetite to fund exactly the sorts of projects. Um, Ethiopia had exactly the same story, a dam called Gibe 3 that was under review by the um, World Bank and by the African Development Bank, was finally pulled because alternate funders came in while those groups were looking at the environmental impact of the project, whether it would have been a low or high impact dam. So whether we count hydro as low greenhouse gas but significant ecological impact or not is a story that is being played out and there is no good solution to it. The only part of it that I've been sort of heartened by is that when the World Commission on Dams started its process, there was a arbitrary distinction where dams smaller than a certain size were defined as sustainable and dams larger than a certain size were defined as not sustainable. That has now changed. The metric is now there needs to be a series of indicators of ecological and human impact, demand for power. Um, and while a metric doesn't solve the story, it has at least clarified the conversation. So that's kind of a long-winded non-answer because I don't think there is an answer yet to that, to that question. Well, I think uh, we'll stop there. Talk. And, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Cameron. Thank you. Thank you.